Well, greetings and salutations, everybody. Welcome to the best damn movie related show on the planet Earth, the John Campy Show, coming from right here on my YouTube channel. I am, of course, your host, John Campia, and it is an awesome honor and privilege, as it is every day, to have you. Our international friends gather as we talk about our favorite things in the world, movies, movie news, TV, streaming, and all sorts of good stuff. And uh, today's show is a little bit different because this is pre-recorded. See, we tried to do the John Campy Show live today, but technology being as it is, technology allows us to do many, many wonderful, incredible things. However, sometimes it can be a pain in the ass. We had Robert Meyer Burnett and Aaron Cummings coming in via Skype today, and then uh, a couple of times Skype just decided to crap out and we couldn't get it back up and running again, so we pulled the plug on the whole thing. We're going to try to find another solution for bringing people in because Skype has been very, very finicky, but we'll try to get that worked out. But we do have a bunch of things that we want to talk about here today. So I made sure we were going to do this show today, even if we had to pre-record it. And that's what we're going to do. And this is how today's show is going to go, guys. We're going to spend the first half of the show talking about some pre-lined up topics. And then we're going to take the second half of the show taking your comments and questions. How do you send in a comment or question to be read on the show? It's simple. Just go down to the tip link that's in the description of this video and you can click on it there or you can enter it in manually at www.streamelements.com slash movieblogtv slash tip. You'll be getting your comment or question read on the show if it's, of course, appropriate for the show. And, of course, you'll be supporting the channel at the same time. And all of us involved here at the John Campion Show, thank you guys so much for that support. But for now, let's just dive into our main topics today. And how do we select our main topics on the John Campus show? It's simple. You guys come up with our main topics. You see, if you ever come across a big topic, issue, or story that you think we need to cover as a main topic on the show, just go anytime, 24-7, over to www.thejohncampiashow.com slash contact. Once you guys get there, you're going to see a form. Fill it out with your topic or question. It's totally free. Hit submit. And then maybe, just maybe, you might see your submission featured as a main topic here on the John Campia Show. With that down, let's get into main topic number one, shall we? And our first main topic today gets submitted to us by Prestonian, who writes, Hey, John and Aaron or Rob, whichever one is there. Well, actually, they were both here earlier today, but now it's just me solo. Anyway, hope you are having a fantastic Friday. Have you heard the news that Antonio Banderas is the latest addition to the fifth installment of Indiana Jones? Alongside the, tit the titular protagonist himself, Harrison Ford, our Mads Mikkelsen, Toby Jones, and Shanette Renee Wilson, and now the former Mask of Zorro star. We don't know what character he's going to portray quite yet, but what are your thoughts on Banderas joining in on the franchise? Thanks, and bring on the filthy. All right, man, thanks a lot for sending that in. And yeah, of course, I still remain a little bit skeptical I'm not going to lie. I still remain a little bit skeptical that we're ever actually going to see this movie. I mean, it took them years to finally start shooting it. Then Harrison Ford gets injured and all this. I'm still a little bit skeptical that we're ever going to see it, but they are moving forward and shooting on the movies happening as we speak. And now they've added Antonio Banderas. Listen, Antonio Banderas is fantastic. Now, has he been in some terrible movies? Oh, there's no denying that. Absolutely. He has, but He's also been in some terrific movies, and he's delivered terrific performances. As a matter of fact, uh, he just got his like first Academy Award nomination, which is really kind of crazy. So he is busy and active. We just saw him in that movie with Ryan Reynolds uh, and Samuel Jackson, the Hitman's Wife's Bodyguard. So he's been staying active, and now he's going to be in Indiana Jones 5. This comes to us from the folks over at Variety who write, Banderas, best known for portraying the masked vigilante in The Mask of Zorro, earned an Oscar nomination for Best Actor in 2019's Pain and Glory. He recently played the antagonist in The Hitman's Wife's Bodyguard alongside Ryan Reynolds, Samuel L. Jackson, and Salma Hayek. He will headline other upcoming franchise films, such as DreamWorks, Puss in Boots, The Last Wish, in case any of you forgot there was another Puss in Boots movie coming, and of course, Sony's Uncharted. And again, that comes to us from the folks over at Variety. Listen, one of the, the longest standing kind of sayings I've had ever since I've been doing movie punditry, like all the way back to the movie blog days when all I did was write articles, is this. It is never a mistake to add talent. Antonio Banderas is a great talent. He's not just a fine actor. He has, you know, that X quality about him. You know, not a mutant power, but he has that X quality about him. Like, it's a quality that guys like 
Dwayne The Rock Johnson, guys like Ryan Reynolds, guys like James Earl Jones has, he has this ability to have this incredible and instant magnetic um, element to his personality and to his presence on screen. Like when he's on screen, he really commands the screen and he's great at it. And I've never seen him in something. Now, listen, I, I of course have seen him in movies that I did not like, but I've never seen him in something where I didn't like what he was doing. Uh, even what's that one called the 13th warrior, the 13th barbarian. I, I can't even remember the name of it. A lot of people like it. I didn't, but I even liked, really liked Antonio Banderas in that and seeing him now kind of coming out and doing villainous characters, which it's not like he's never done them before he has, but that's been great. Now we don't know if he's going to play a villain in Indiana Jones or not. For all we know, he's going to be Indy's long lost younger brother. I mean, I don't know, but whatever it is, he's going to be playing I'm glad that he's in this movie because like I said before, it's never a mistake to add talent. The question is for you guys. What do you think about the addition of Antonio Banderas in the Indiana Jones 5 film coming up? I think it's fantastic. What do you guys think? Jump down into the comment section below and let us know your thoughts. All right, guys, with that down and out of the way, let's move on to main topic number two. And our second main topic today gets submitted to us by Josh Gutierrez, who writes, Never thought we'd see the day, but Dwayne Johnson has confirmed on social media that Black Adam has officially wrapped production. I never thought this day would come. A project that feels 20 plus years in the making. How excited are you to finally see this movie? Thanks and bring on the filthy. All right. Thanks a lot for sending that in, man. Look, going all the way back, my favorite event to go to every year isn't actually Comic-Con, although I, I love going to San Diego Comic-Con, love it. But my favorite event every year is actually CinemaCon that happens every year in Vegas. Now, for those of you who don't know much about CinemaCon, it's this giant convention that is for is put on by NATO, the, uh, the uh, North American Theater Owners uh, Association. And what happens is all the movie theater owners and all general managers and staff and executives and, and people in the movie theater industry, people who make seats and projectors and sound systems and concession stand equipment and all that kind of stuff, they all go there. And then all the movie studios, they all come and put on these big two-hour presentations about all their upcoming movies in the next year. And they bring a lot of their celebrities and stars of those movies and it's a terrific thing. It's not open to the public, but it is something I've gotten to go to like six or seven times. And it feels like it was like, I want to say it was like 2016. I, I, I haven't looked it up to be positive, but it I'm going to go with 2016 right now that Dwayne The Rock Johnson came out during Warner Brothers presentation to talk about Black Adam that there's a new power structure in the world of DC. He's been saying that for five years now. There's a new power structure. You know, they shall taste the bottom of my boot or something along those lines. He came out on stage with all his Dwayne The Rock Johnson charisma, you know, all this kind of stuff and talking about it and then nothing 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 until finally they started shooting the damn movie and it actually became a real thing. And now Dwayne The Rock Johnson, we've heard it was getting close to wrapping, but Dwayne The Rock Johnson has now taken to social media and he's made it official. They are done shooting Black Adam. It's in the can. Now it's just going into post-production. This comes to us to Cinema Blend, who writes, taking to his Instagram page, Dwayne Johnson announced to the world that Black Adam has finished shooting and described the experience as easily the hardest labor and toughest grind mentally and physically of his entire career. Now, here's something interesting. I think a lot of times we are accustomed to hearing actors or athletes talking about their latest endeavor, whatever their latest endeavor is, as being the most fun or the best or the hardest or whatever that they've ever done. Right? We're, we're kind of used to hearing actors and producers and directors say that. But when it comes to Black Adam, I think we actually have to take Dwayne The Rock Johnson seriously. This is a movie that even when they announced it back at CinemaCon, that they were going to be doing this five, six, however many years ago that was, it was something that they had been working on behind the scenes for a couple of years even before that. And then when that did finally look like something was going to happen a number of years ago, it hit some hurdles. 
got delayed. And then again, when it looked like they were going to get started again, the whole COVID thing happened and there were more delays. And it just kind of felt like this was one of those projects that I hate using the C word, but was maybe cursed. Right. And a lot of people started wondering, were we ever actually going to see this thing? And we are. And so when Dwayne The Rock Johnson now comes out and he says something along the lines of this has honestly been the hardest, most grueling, most taxing, challenging project of his career. I think you can believe him on that. I, I really do think it is. There had to have been times that probably he even didn't know if this thing was ever going to happen. But here we are. Now it's done. So now that this thing has been shot, though. This is where the hard part starts. Because now that the movie's shot and we have spent years exclusively discussing, is this thing ever going to happen? When are they going to finally get rolling on Black Adam? Is Black Adam still even happening? With where the DCU is now, which is in a very different place than it was when they first announced Black Adam, can it still happen? Well, now that they've done shooting it, now the uncomfortable questions come. Is this movie going to be any good? And that's... A fair question. Now, look, you guys know if you've been watching my show for any period of time, I am a legit big Dwayne The Rock Johnson fan. I really like Dwayne The Rock Johnson a great deal. Uh, I like his movies. I like his charisma. I like what he brings to the screen. I like all that stuff. And sometimes his movies are great and sometimes they're not so great. Can he actually, because you know he had a lot of control over this. Can he actually bring something to a comic book movie? Now, he's clearly got the physique. And that little presentation they did at DC Fandom last year was really good. You know, we found out the GASA was going to be a part of it. We got a little bit of a sense of the artistic stylings that were going to be going on. If I'm not mistaken, um, they, you know, that was directly taken from a lot of the, uh, the pages they were doing. And Boss Logic, I believe, also helped. You know, Boss Logic is a treasure of the fan community i think he actually helped with some of those sketches whatever and that all looked really good but is it actually going to be any good and that's going to be the question that we're now going to have but hey at least it's done shooting it's in the can they go into post-production and now the countdown to when this movie finally comes out can start the question is for you guys how are you feeling about black adam right now the movie's now complete i mean it's shot it's far from complete, still post-production due. But the movie's now shot. It's in the can. They've done the work on set. And now we turn our attention, is the movie going to be any good? And what are you guys thinking about that? Do you guys have a lot of hope for this movie or a little bit skeptical of it? Have you been excited since that DC fandom presentation? Maybe that presentation didn't do it for you like it did for me. Whatever you guys are thinking, jump on down to the comment section below and let us know your thoughts. Okay, guys. With that down and out of the way, let's move on to main topic number three, shall we? And our third main topic today gets submitted to us by Alan Wright. And Alan Wright writes, say that three times fast. Alan Wright writes, hey, John, I just wanted to know if you saw the story several sites are reporting on, including Cinema Blend, uh, which is a site uh, I know you reference often. It is a site I reference often. I, I think Cinema Blend is a fantastic, one of the better websites uh, out there as far as the movie and entertainment industry goes. Anyway, I know it's a site you reference often that Robert Pattinson and Matt Reeves hate each other and Pattinson refuses to ever work with him again, which is putting any potential sequel to the Batman in trouble. What do you make of these reports? All right. Thanks so much for sending that in, man. Yeah, Batman, or I should say The Batman, is a movie that, I mean, for, first of all, this movie was born in controversy, if you if you will, maybe more than that. It was born in drama. Let's at least say that. The Batman project that we have coming out was born in drama because, of course, it was surrounded the situation with Ben Affleck leaving Batman. Because don't forget, for a long time, Ben Affleck was supposed to write, direct, and star in a solo Batman movie, something I desperately wanted to see. And I know a lot of you guys desperately wanted to see that too. And of course, then I was the first one to come out and tell you guys Ben Affleck was out. He wasn't going to be Batman anymore. And it wasn't for like another year and a half until Warner Brothers finally made it public and, and let people in on what had been true for a couple of years that Ben Affleck was out. And then, of course, you know, they first announced that he was out as director and that they were bringing in Matt Reeves. And, you know, I wanted a Ben Affleck directed movie. But, hey, if it can't be Ben Affleck, Matt Reeves is a terrific choice. He's a great director. But then, of course, 
they finally came clean that Ben Affleck himself wasn't going to be in it. Now we're going to have Robert Pattinson. That started its own bunch of controversy because a lot of people who don't really know much about movies are like, wait a minute, they're getting the Twilight Boy to play Batman? Of course, people don't actually understand, you know, movies are more than just comic book movies. And Robert Pattinson has been spending almost a decade starring and doing amazing in these smaller indie films and getting the attention of all the directors in Hollywood, including Christopher Nolan, who made him one of his leads in his most uh, recent film, of course. And, but everybody who knows Robert Pattinson's work was like, you know what? This dude is an A-list actor and he could do very, very well. So the whole project has just been simmering in drama right from the beginning. And it hasn't helped that, you know, over the past month or two, there's been all these unfounded rumors and stories. Oh, this problem with Batman and that problem with Batman and all that kind of stuff too. Like, oh, Robert Pattinson walked out of set. No, blah, blah, blah. Now there's been a story floating around a little bit recently that Matt Reeves and Robert Pattinson absolutely hate each other. They absolutely hate each other. And that Robert Pattinson will refuse to work ever again with Matt Reeves. That That's the whispers about him going around some of the shadier corners of the internet, right? And of course, nobody gives that kind of BS any sort of credibility. However, when a site like Cinema Blend starts running these headlines, because Cinema Blend is not Gus's gas station reviews dot fart, right? This isn't some obscure little, I mean, Cinema Blend isn't exactly Variety, the Hollywood Reporter, you know, deadline. It's, it's not on that level, but I'd say Cinema Blend is on that, just that next step down where sites like Coming Soon and Joe Blow and Cinema Blend, like really good, reputable, I believe really good websites and stuff like that. So the problem is Cinema Blend runs a headline saying the Batman rumor puts Robert Pattinson's sequel in jeopardy. Let's hope it's not true. So now what happens is when there are just these little quiet whispers going around the dark corners of the internet, yeah, some people picked up on it, but most people knew well enough to ignore it. But when a site like Cinema Blend runs it, well, then people are going to take it, understandably, they're going to take it a whole lot more seriously. Because Cinema Blend is, again, they're not the Hollywood Reporter, they're not Variety, they're not Deadline, but, you know, they're a major player. And I reference Cinema Blend all the time. I love this website. I, I've been, I've respected Cinema Blend for a long time, all the way back to my movie blog days. I, I've always really liked this site. And I still do. They're great. So... Does that mean since Cinema Blend is running headlines now on this drama going on behind scenes that Matt Reeves and Robert Pattinson hate each other, does that mean it's legit? Well, one of the things I always tell you guys is it doesn't matter what website you're reading it on. Follow the source. Look to see where that website is getting their information from. And when we do that, it seems to paint a little bit of a better picture for us. This comes to us from Cinema Blend, who wrote the following. Anticipation for the Batman has, has been steadily building with limited footage arriving last summer that revealed Matt Reeves' ultra-realistic vision for the blockbuster. Fans are eager to see him face a trio of villains, and there are also plenty of theories about who might pop up in a potential sequel. Unfortunately, a rumor surrounding the Batman is that Robert Pattinson and director Matt Reeves are feuding, with the Twilight actor not wanting to work with Matt Reeves again in the future, which is, of course, a problem if Matt Reeves is directing another Batman movie. This wild report comes to us from... Sigh. We got this covered.com. And should be taken with a giant grain of salt. Let me read that last sentence again. This wild report comes to us from wegotthiscovered.com and should be taken with a giant grain of salt. All right. This story does not come from Cinema Blend. Even though Cinema Blend ran a headline, all Cinema Blend did was they took a story from We Got This Covered and they decided to run it as a headline of their own. Now look, I often talk about how I am not here to talk about other YouTube channels. I'm not here to talk about how other outlets do their things. But because Cinema Blend is a site I reference all the time and I hold in extremely high esteem, I will say this Cinema Blend, what the F are you doing? You know, listen, Cinema Blend knows well enough 
that if it's coming from wegotthiscovered.com, it's bullshit and should 100% be ignored, which is what almost everybody else did. Everybody ignored it because it was coming from wegotthiscovered.com. So everybody knows well enough to ignore it. And Cinema Blend knows well enough to ignore it. Why they chose to run a headline on that is beyond me. And saying, well, you know, it should be taken with a grain of salt. No, no, no. If you're running a story that has anything to do with wegotthiscovered.com, you should be straying, saying straight up to your audience, do not believe this. There may be a half a percent or maybe even a 1% chance that this rumor about Robert Pattinson on the Batman and Matt Reeves feuding, there's a half a percent to a 1% chance, just like there is almost in anything in life, then maybe it could be true. But basically, if it's coming from wegotthiscover.com, you should ignore it. Now, the ramifications of this go further because not only by a respectable site like Cinema Blend, which is great running this headline, I got tons of messages last night from people like, like well-intending people like the one who sent in the main email here for our topic today, because now, well, wait a minute, this didn't, this, this isn't, we got this covered. This is on cinema blend. There's gotta be something to it, right? I got dozens of messages via social media in the comment section being sent in directly as a topic. And here's the other thing, because cinema blend ran it, A couple of other sites ran it as well that weren't going to run it because it was on We Got This Covered. But since Cinema Blend ran it, well, you can just say we heard this from Cinema Blend. And you see how this terrible, chaotic game of broken telephone starts to go. Look, am I sitting here telling you that it is impossible that Robert Pattinson and Matt Reeves don't get along? Of course, that's not impossible. They're they're human beings. Sometimes human beings don't get along. However, it's coming from wegotthiscovered.com, which I believe, let me just double check my, uh, one second, carry the four. Yes, they're carrying a 0% accuracy rate. Still zero, Um, or at least damn close to zero. So no, it, it shouldn't be listened to at all. Also, Robert Pattinson has never, other than that time that I got so pissed off at him because he was talking about, yeah, I didn't even bother working out for Batman. And that just pissed me off. Now, apparently he's come out afterwards and said he was joking about that, but oh my God, that pissed me off. Anyway, so Robert Pattinson has never had a reputation of being difficult. He's never had a reputation of not getting along or at least being able to act cordially and professionally with all the different people he has worked with on the wide variety of films he's worked with. He's just never come across other than... That whole thing about I won't work out for Batman. He's never really come across to anybody that I've spoken to as any kind of a prima donna. Nor has Matt Reeves. I've heard Matt Reeves can be a hard director, but that's to me, that's a good thing. There's a difference between being hard and being completely unreasonable. I like leaders who are hard and without crossing the line into becoming completely unreasonable. I like that. And I think when you have two professionals like that work out. So number one, it just it's a story that doesn't make sense. But more importantly, you got to remember it came from wegotthiscovered.com. So play no attention to it. And I will say this, only because they're one of my favorites. And I'll only say something this critical to somebody who's one of my favorites. And Cinema Blend is one of my favorites. But Cinema Blend, come on, man. Come on, man, like they would say on ESPN. Come on, man. You, you knew what you were doing. You knew it was completely unreliable and putting in a little line like, oh, it should be taken with a grain of salt. No, 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 no. It shouldn't have been run with in the first place. And if you were going to run with it, you should only run with it to clarify to your readers. They should not believe this rumor if they read it. But your rumors, your, your readers never would have heard of it if you didn't carry it because you're cinema blend. And by you carrying it, it's now respectable. It's now got some credibility because cinema blend ran it. So come on, come on, guys. You know what you're doing. Do better. Because you're one of the best. So please do better. Anyway, guys, the question is for you. What do you think about this? Maybe you think, maybe you're one of these people that you believe that there's big drama going on on the set of Batman. Because don't don't forget, there was also like the same people that recently were saying, oh, the Warner Brothers executives hate the new Batman movie. And that was all BS too. This, people just seem to be 
obsessed with causing drama with this movie that was, to be fair, kind of born in drama in the first place. What are your guys' thoughts on this? Jump on down into the comments section below and let us know your thoughts. Okay, guys. With that down, let's move on to main topic number four, shall we? And our fourth main topic today gets submitted to us by Devin Patrick, who writes, Greetings, John and Rob. Well, of course, unfortunately, I'm so flying solo right now, but just wondering what you thought about the interview Tom Hiddleston just did, where he said he is more than willing to play Loki for the rest of his career. I'm used to hearing about these actors looking forward to moving on from the roles that they've ma that made them rich and famous. So I'm kind of it's kind of refreshing to hear one that actually wants to stay. Do you think this gives us a hint that the MCU plans on using L Loki a lot more in the future? Okay, thanks a lot for that, Devin. And you're right. You're right. You know, as the comic book genre has exploded, and a lot of the actors who kind of got in on the ground floor of it got to ride that wave and become some of the most popular, recognizable stars in the world because of these properties, it's kind of become expected that we start to hear things like, yeah, I'm, I'm going to do one or two more and then I'm moving on, or I'm looking forward to new challenges or stuff like that. And, and I believe me, I understand that. I totally do. I totally get it. But at the same time, there's a part of me that feels a little bit the, the entitled snotty fan part of me that all of us have. We all have this entitled snotty fan part of all of us, right? So there's this little part of me that's the entitled snotty fan part that kind of feels like whenever they talk about it's like, hey man, come on, let's let's be honest here. Like, most of us wouldn't even know who you are if it wasn't for the fact that DC cast you in this. Or most of us wouldn't even know who you are if Kevin Feige and Marvel didn't cast you in that. And all we hear you talking about is what you're going to do next and moving on. Hey, you know, we, we kind of made you big, rich, and famous. Maybe you can just talk about how great it is to be in these. I, I, so I get it. You're right. And we've seen that happen a lot. And we've seen certain actors move on and then come back and then move on. But anyway... So what he's talking about here is that Tom Hiddleston was recently doing an interview talking about, of course, Loki and uh, and the finale that just happened and stuff like that. And Tom Hiddleston, this is what he said. He said something that I thought was pretty cool. He said the following. If I were asked to play Loki for the rest of my life, I would. Or would I? Yeah, I absolutely would. I'm so lucky that I've got to play Loki for this long. And you know, I feel like he's such an interesting character who's been around in human consciousness for so long. He's got so many different aspects, so many different complex characteristics that it feels like every time I play him, I find out something new or we get to evolve him or take him down an avenue that we haven't gone down before. And again, that first part, if I were asked to play Loki again for the rest of my life, would I? Yeah, absolutely. Let me tell you something. I love hearing an actor who, let's, let's face it, Tom Hiddleston, he's a very, very gifted actor. He would have made a career for himself even without Loki, but he's on all of our radars right now because of Loki. It is so nice to hear an actor who has talent to do more, and we've seen him do more. He's gone, when he hasn't been shooting Marvel stuff, he's gone off and done very well shooting other things, but it's so nice to hear an actor who, number one, recognizes I've got the career status that I have because of this role and because of the fans who love me as this character. And to then say, I love it and I'll do it for the rest of my life. Now, of course, I don't think any of us who are rational or reasonable fully expect Tom Hiddleston to actually play Loki for the rest of his life, but it's nice hearing that kind of attitude come out of him. And I don't mean that as a slam on any other actor who hasn't come. I'm not saying that every actor needs to come out and say, yes, I hereby pledge my lifelong fidelity to this character and this cinematic universe only forever and always till the day I die. I'm not saying I need the other actors to do that. I'm just saying it's kind of refreshing hearing one kind of do that. It it makes me feel like he really appreciates what he's got and that he appreciates us, the entitled snotty fans. It just it just feels nice, right? Now, as far as the second part of your question about does this tell us anything potentially about 
maybe the MCU using Loki a lot more moving forward. And maybe this is a bit of a stretch, but I'm going to say yes. I, I, I do think so. Now, listen, we've already heard that they are going to shoot, they're going to do Loki season two, and they're already working out what the details of Loki season two are going to be. That was predetermined. So there's that. But then we started getting these reports from the Hollywood Reporter that he was going to be in Doctor Strange 2, which Marvel has not confirmed. But again, it was coming from the Hollywood Reporter, so I'm going to give them the benefit of the doubt until we hear otherwise. I mean, it's possible it's not true, but I'm going to give them the benefit of the doubt until we hear otherwise. So there's that. And yeah, listen, when you give the character Loki, now whether you loved or hated the Loki series... When you give a character that kind of story arc and you give his character that much evolution, because we went through a great story arc of character evolution for Loki in this. Like whether you liked anything else or not, you got to acknowledge that he had incredible character evolution, incredible character development, going from the Loki we saw in episode one to the Loki we got in episode six. I feel like you only do that if you're setting him up for other things in the universe as well. Now, again, I have no insider information on that. I don't know that that's actually true. Maybe it is. Maybe it's not. We'll find out as we progress. But if you're asking me my opinion, I feel like Tom Hiddleston saying that is a little bit of a hint that, yeah, he is expecting to be around playing Loki for a while. And listen, I've told told you this before. Steve Rogers, Captain America, is my absolute favorite character in the MCU. Not in comics, but in the MCU he is. Tom Hiddleston's Loki has been my second favorite. He's been my second favorite. And that's no disrespect to Chris Helmsworth and the amazing Thor he gives. I love Chris Helmsworth as Thor, but I've always loved the complexity. Ever since the great Kenneth Branagh directed that first Thor movie and gave us a Loki, a villain that clearly had multiple layers and there are different dimensions to him. And I've always liked him as a character. I, for one, with the idea that he may be around for a long time in the MCU... It makes me feel a little bit better about the future of the MCU. But anyway, guys, that's just me. Question is for you. What do you think about Tom Hiddleston's words saying that, hey, man, I will play Loki for the rest of my life? I kind of like it. Do you think it's an indication that the MCU has talked to him about future plans? Whatever you guys think, jump on down to the comment section below and let us know your thoughts. Okay, guys, with all that down and out of the way, let's now move on and start taking your comments and questions. Once again, if you want to get a comment or question right on the show, just go down to the description of this video and you can use that link anytime you want and it'll be in an upcoming show or companion video if it's appropriate for the show. Just click on that link or you can enter it in manually at streamelements.com slash movieblogtv slash tip. Again, you'll be getting your comment or question right on the show if it's appropriate for the show. And, of course, you'll be supporting the show at the same time. And all of us involved here at the John Campus Show, thank you guys so much for your support. All right. And with that down, let's get into it, shall we? And we're going to start things off here with James Lockman, who writes, "Uh, I just watched Nobody and I loved it. That bus scene. Phew. Yeah. Now, this was actually the last question that came in on yesterday's show. But then YouTube froze, like, just as we were doing the last question on yesterday's show. Anyway. Yeah, nobody uh, starring Bob Odenkirk. That was like the second or third, I'm going to say maybe third, third movie that I went to go see in theaters once, you know, uh, the restrictions started lifting and the theaters opened back up. Oh my God, that movie was so much fun. I mean, obviously because of who's behind it, people involved with John Wick, it looked like just a pure John Wick ripoff. But I'm telling you what, that movie was an awful lot of fun, man. Bob Odenkirk was great. Um... Everybody in the movie was just fantastic. Like his dad, you know, you had Doc Brown playing his dad, which was fantastic. I think that was RZA in it as well. And he was a lot of fun. Just, it was just a lot of fun. It was super hyper violent, but Bob Odenkirk made that movie really sing. And the direction was fantastic. And again, not going to win any Academy Awards, mind you, but it was an awful lot of fun. And I'm glad you liked it, James. All right, next up, we've got uh, Black Rice 19 who writes, I feel like Valentina's anti-Avengers team she's forming will be the villains in the next Avengers film uh, whenever that will be. He who remains will be saved for later on down the road. Thoughts? Uh, No, and it's, I mean, it's Kang, but no, I don't think so. Because honestly, right now, what do we got? Right now, we've got a pseudo wannabe Captain America 
who couldn't take the other guys who were also sort of Captain America and Bucky and Sam. So there's that. So he's like a B-lister, C-bench guy at best. They've got a non-powered um, discount Black Widow. and Val- Now, don't, don't get me wrong. I loved Yelena. I loved L- Yelena. I think this is a great character. I'm really, really happy for her. But she's not as formidable as Natasha. She's not Black Widow. They, they might call her Black Widow at some point, but she's not Black Widow. So if this is the team they're putting together to be the ultimate foil for Avengers and Avengers 5, they've got a lot of work to do. They, they've got a lot of work to do. So I, I don't think so. I, by the way, I don't even think, I don't know this, no inside information. This is just me speculating blindly as a fan. I don't think Kang is going to be the big bad for Avengers 5 either. I don't know who it's going to be. Uh, but I don't, I mean, it could be any of those things, but I don't think it's going to be Kang. I don't think it's going to be Valentina's, you know, uh, Avengers light team that she's putting together, at least not by the looks of it so far, but you might be right. You could be right. Let's see what happens as we move forward. All right. Next up, we've got Canadian singing posty. Oh, our friend, the Canadian singing posty writes in, he writes, Hey, John and co so stoked as Ontario has finally opened up their theaters after almost a year shutdown. That is so exciting. Last movie was Tenet. Uh, treating myself to a double feature of Quiet Place 2. Awesome. That's my favorite film of the year so far. So glad I didn't miss it in theaters. And Black Widow with a friend. Again, getting to see those on the big screen. I'm so glad you're being able to see that. I'm very excited for my friends up in Ontario. Uh, that's in Canada, for those of you who don't know. And I'm going to finally be able to go back to the movies again. That's great. I was kind of wondering because, you know, my parents have their 50th anniversary coming up. And I've got to figure out a way that I can fly home. And I'm really hoping that the travel restrictions, the quarantine restrictions will be lifted because it's just in September, which isn't too far away. And I've also been a little bit worried that if I do go up there, am I going to be able to go to the movies? I really hope so. So hearing that this is opening up is great. Remember, guys, there are surges happening again. Please don't be a moron. It should be that simple just to say to people, hey, guys, it's a pandemic. Don't act like a moron. It's surprising how many people you actually have to say that to, but uh, it's true. Anyway, I hope that this is a trend that continues well. I hope that everything's able to open up great and that the theaters stay open up there. And I'm glad you're going to be able to go. And uh, I can't wait for you to see Quiet Place 2 on the big screen. I love that movie. All right, next up. Obi Bram Kenobi writes, one of two. Hey, John, after watching the Loki finale, I feel that the What If series will be more relevant, more a Meanwhile in Another Universe series than a What If series. I'm really looking forward to it now. Looks amazing and love that last trailer. Yeah, I, I'm not going to lie to you. I'm not incredibly excited about the What If series. I never have been. I got a little bit more interested in it back at the last D23 they did when they actually showed us some some actual scenes and some footage and stuff like that. That got me a little bit more interested. Still not tremendously interested. But one of the things that they made very clear was this is a what if series. It is their version of Elseworlds. Now, yeah, you could play semantics if you want to and say, well, since there's multiverses, this could actually be real in some multi... Okay, you could do that if you want, but it's not real. It will have... Anything that happens in the What If series will have absolutely no actual real impact or ramifications on anything that's actually happening in the MCU. Now, again, you can play semantics and say, but since it's multiverse, it could be... Okay, yeah... You go ahead and do that. Yeah, Howard the Duck becomes Captain America in one of the... Sure, go run with that. If, if it makes you feel better, run with that. But as long as the reality is it has absolutely zero impact whatsoever or any ramifications on what the actual MCU is... And again, Kevin Feige made this pretty clear at D23. It is unrelated. It is unrelated. Play semantics if you want, but it's actually unrelated. So go into it and enjoy it as such. You know, enjoy it for what it's meant to be. What if? Just the creators at Marvel imagining wild different scenarios. Well, what if this happened? And what if this happened? Things that didn't happen, but what they did. And run with them. Go enjoy it as such. And don't start tethering your anticipation to, well, what if it's actually connected to the upcoming? Eh. So unless Kevin Feige was straight up bold-faced lying, which he's never really done before, um, then no, it's not. But again, it's all in the semantics of it. And you look at it 
however makes it more entertaining for you. I guess that's the bottom line. Look at it however it makes it more entertaining for you. I goes on to say two of two. Uh, the watcher saying, I observe all that transpires here, but I do not, cannot, and will not interfere. Got a more deeper meaning to me now. I think that the watcher might have a bigger role in this multiverse saga than previously expected. Your thoughts? I don't. I don't think they're going to go as wild as the watcher. But John Stan Lee, was, uh, yeah, yeah, I know, I know, but it, come on. Um, I mean, listen, that's not to say that they couldn't. And and at some point, maybe further down the road. But do I think that's actually going to come into play here early? I don't think so. But again, that's not me as a Hollywood insider. That's me as an average fan just speculating, saying no. And I only bring it up because you asked me. So you think the watch is going to be there? I don't think so. But anything is possible. Anything is possible. All right. Thanks for writing that in, Obi Brahm. I love that name, by the way. All right. Anonymous viewer writes. Do you think we might see a live action version of one or more what if characters in Doctor Strange 2? No. Uh, I give it a 30% chance. I give it 0% chance because, again, of what Kevin Feige said. For example, a Captain Carter cameo, however briefly, uh, wouldn't love seeing Petty Carter kicking ass again? Um, yeah, but it's, it's, it's just nonsense. To me, it's just nonsense. And again, listen. Kevin Feige may have both lay slide, but I'm going to go with what he said at D23, that this is an isolated thing. It's not actually a real thing. So, no, I'm going to go 0% on that. By the way, I haven't had Kevin Feige get on the phone with me in the last 48 hours to reiterate to me, Campia, what if is completely separate from me? It's not like this has ha that's happened. So it's possible. But if you're asking me, not nah, 0% chance, 0% chance. And if they do, I'm, I'm going to kind of start giving up on the MCU because then they're just getting too ridiculous. But... Uh, and you guys know how much I love the MCU, but no, I, I think that's a pretty much a 0% chance they're going to do that. All right, DJ Taterskins writes, John, one of two, uh, put the hand up if you have to, but I need to know, love Loki episode six, even being a comic reader, I have confusion. Uh, are he who remains in Kang in the books, one and the same, didn't think so, please clarify, Majors was amazing. Here's, look, bottom line, DJ, let me make it real simple for you. Don't worry about what's in the comic books. I'm just going to make it real simple for you. Don't worry about what's in the comic books. That was Kang you saw in the thing. That was Kang. Now, there are going to be many variations of Kang, according to what he said in the show. There are going to be many variations of Kang. And according to the episode, they all look exactly alike. Like, unlike the Lokis, all the variants of Kang that were brought up, they all looked exactly alike. And according to also what he said, they're all going to have some uniqueness to their personalities. But for right now, and this is what Robert, Robert and I were talking about this more a few days ago, obviously, but really bottom line is don't even worry. The comics are the comics. The MCU is the MCU. They're going to borrow some themes. They'll do something similarly, but they're going to do their own thing. And they're obviously very much doing their own thing. So I wouldn't even worry about it. The, this is the MCU and that was Kang. So that's all you need to worry about for now. All right, next up. We got DJ Taterskins. Oh, the, also two of two. Also, I meant the rise of the resistance. Uh, when I said I went to Disneyland, amazing ride, wowed, I actually made it. Uh, system to get on is a ripoff. My son joined us later on and wouldn't let me ride it two times in one day. Thanks, Mickey. Well, listen, dude, don't complain. Most people who go to the park wanting to ride that ride will not be able to ride the ride. So don't complain that you didn't get to ride it twice. I myself will never go back to Disneyland again. I might try Disney World if I ever get down to Florida, because a lot of people tell me the experience there is better. But yeah, I've been ripped off by Disneyland too many times. I won't be going back to Disneyland, but that's just me. But any, I'm, I'm not organizing any kind of boycott. You want to go to Disneyland, you go to Disneyland, have a good time. But listen, I was lucky enough that I did get to ride Rise of the Resistance just before the COVID shutdown. And yeah, full marks. It's a great ride. It really is. It is a great ride. I had, a, me and Ann had a blast on it when we got to go ride on it. Uh, again, this was just like literally days before COVID shut it down. Uh, but it is a fantastic ride. So uh, here's hoping if you guys are going to Disneyland, fingers crossed, I hope you get on it because it's a really, really fun time. It really is. All right, next up. Uh, Ogre Dawn writes, you and Robert Meyer Burnett are figure why... Let me try this again. You and Robert Meyer Burnett are figure why Transformers plus Battleship plus Avatar Gully do so good globally. Cameron and Bay love military and minimize showing civvies die. So their films are hours of blowing up U.S. soldiers. The more, uh, the more, the more moneyer roast me for tinfoil, but it's there. Uh, I think, no, I think you're crazy. 
I don't think that has, that has nothing to do with it. And by the way, I mean, if you even trying to loop Avatar into that is ridiculous. Um, the big action spectacles do well overseas. Not all of them, but for the most part, they do. That and that Ogredon has nothing to do with it. All right, D.W. Dunphy writes, While James Gunn's participation brings Suicide Squad expectations high, in your opinion, are early reviews for Gunn's squad uh, benefiting from lowered expectations because of uh, the David Ayer squad, Filthy Forever? It's impossible to say because I haven't seen it. How can I say that it's benefiting from lower expectations when I haven't seen the movie yet? And, and by the way, you have to, I, I can't help but laugh inside a little bit when people who do not know these reviewers try to psychoanalyze these reviewers that they don't know, right? It, it just makes me giggle a little bit when, when, first of all, when I see people who don't know me from Adam try to psychoanalyze, why did John feel this way? You don't know me. You can't possibly know, let alone, you know, 30 other you know, pundits who you have never met, never seen, whatever, and yet you're trying to psychoanalyze what's going on in their heads. Listen, the vast majority of these people, they watch a lot of movies. They know how to walk into a movie and just take it for what it is, right? Maybe you can't, and I'm not saying you can't, but maybe you think because you can't make that distinction in yourself that you just think everybody else can't do it either. Um... And maybe that's the case, but no, I don't think they're only doing it because they had lower expectations. I, I, oh, and by the way, never make up excuses for why somebody else feels something. If they're saying they loved it, then it's because they loved it. If they say they hate it, it's because they hate it. Don't start playing the game of making up fake excuses and reasons about why somebody else thought something. When you don't know them, you're not in their head. You have no idea what their background is and what their experiences are. And you didn't see the movie yourself. So I would say, DW, don't even think about that. Look, and just because they loved it and the early reviews coming out are like nothing I've ever heard. I've never heard early reviews for a comic book movie like this. I've never heard anything to this level. But that doesn't mean you're going to agree, and it doesn't mean I'm going to agree. It just means that these particular people, and they're a very diverse, different group of people, but it just means that they saw it, and they loved it, and they're just telling you they loved it. Now, maybe you will too, but maybe you won't. But if you don't, don't then get into the habit of, well, they just said they liked it because... Don't play that game. Acknowledge that movies are subjective. Some people are going to have an experience with the movie that yours might differ from. And that doesn't mean any of you are lying. It just means you're giving your impressions and your thoughts on something. So don't play that game of trying to instantly find an excuse or trying to psychoanalyze people you don't know. That's, that's my encouragement. That's my encouragement. All right. Next up, Ben Rayner writes, Hey, John, about Spider-Man, a uh, new strange, let's, let's try this again. Hi, John, about Spider-Man, new strange like outfit. I am hoping that this isn't our Spidey. Remember No Way Home. I am thinking we'll be getting multiple Spider-Man versions, uh, flashes with different costumes, nothing long, just like five to ten second segments maybe. Again, I don't want to make any assumptions. Like, that's, you just made an assumption that's built on another assumption, right? And I, I do this all the time, so I know it. so I know it when I see it because I do it too. But you got to be careful when you're making an assumption on top of an assumption. I assume there's going to be multiple Spider-Man. And since I'm assuming there's going to be all these multiple Spider-Man, I'm assuming that this one Spider-Man might be one of those multiples. And it's like, well, I mean, that, that might be true. It might be true. Listen, they could get so nutty with this movie, which may or may not be a good thing. I'm, I'm just being honest with you guys. It may or may not be a good thing, to, depending on how nutty they go. But I trust Sam Raimi. I trust Sam. Sam Raimi is a director. First of all, I, I trust Feige, but... Sam Raimi's a director who's always seemed to have a really good finger on the pulse of knowing how nutty you can make something without going absolutely, completely nutty. You know, even when you go and look at something like Army of Darkness and stuff like that, like he knows how to make it ridiculous, but then he knows when to stop, right? And he's always had that sensibility. 
I even liked, you could even tell that sensibility when he did that Oz the Great and Powerful. Not everybody liked that movie, but I, I kind of did. I liked that Oz the Great and Powerful. And you saw that same kind of sensibility in that movie that he brought to those others. So I think he's going to know how to do that. That being said, could it be that the Spider-Man we see in the black and gold thing that's covering his regular Spider-Man suit and he's shooting like what looks like mystical energy web, so he's a little Doctor Strange Jr.? Is it possible that that's just some random alternate universe Spider-Man that pops up for a minute? That's possible. I think, though, if they're making a hot toy out of it, it's probably a major character. Now, that's not for sure. But my guess is, is that if that hot toy is making a big hot toy, if Sideshow is making a big hot toy out of this, which is, of course, what we covered on the show the other day, then my guess is that it's it's probably the main character. It's probably our Spider-Man. It's, uh, it's not normal. I'm not saying it's unprecedented, but it's not normal that Sideshow would take a random character that just shows up for a second and do a full, you know, a full hot toy of them. I, I, they just don't normally do that. So my guess is, and it's just a guess, because I could be wrong and you could be right, but my guess is that that tells me that it is probably our Peter. And we'll find out soon enough. We will find out soon enough. But anyway, good thoughts on that, uh, Ben. Thanks for sending that in. All right, next up. Soul Brother Mac writes, Man, I wrote this long five-part comment about why I thought Loki variant for only Marvel to just go with the obvious and bring out Kang. Anyway, uh, did you notice that Loki went into an alternate TVA before He Who Remains died? Uh, how did that happen? I don't think he went into an alt. First of all, it wasn't... <clears throat> Let's start with this one thing. I've been trying to tell everybody for all this time, I believe it's going to be Kang, but it's not obvious it was going to be Kang because 95% of the people who are watching Loki have never heard of Kang. Right. So in general, it was a massive surprise to most people, to the vast, 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 vast majority of the people who are watching Loki. Because remember, you and I are the 5%. We're the 5% of the viewing audience that, you know, we either watch or do these kind, kinds of shows. We follow the news. We know the comics and all that kind of stuff. We're like 5%. We feel like we are the majority because we travel in circles of the 5%. So everybody we know knows it. So we just assume everybody knows it. But the reality is that 90 to 95% of the audience have never even heard of Kang the Conqueror. They've never heard of him. So to them, just like Agatha, 95% of the people had never heard of Agatha Harkness. So to some people, it was brutally obvious it was going to be Agatha. But very, very small percentage of the people knew that. Most of the people watching it never knew. So there's that. I do not believe, remember, Loki didn't go into an alternate TVA. I don't believe because the TVA is outside of the timeline. The TVA is not affected by different branches of the timeline and all that kind of stuff because the TVA is outside of all of that. I believe in science fiction there is a thin but distinct difference between the idea of alternate timeline and reality being altered. I think those are two different concepts. And I think, and I could be wrong, this is just me as a fan speculating, I think what we saw happen, because the TVA sits outside of time, that wasn't just some variant timeline version of the TVA. The TVA is outside of time. It's not affected by it at least according to the rules that the show laid out for us. So I think the very nature of reality was shifted and changed. So I think that's the TVA that he went into. The TVA he knew. It's just that reality had been altered. Now, how that's all going to actually connect and how it will actually all play out, I mean, who knows? We've got a probably a good year and a half to wait until Loki season two. But, uh, but we'll get there. We'll get there. All right, thanks for sending that in, Soul Brother. All right, next up. We got Kevin Feige writes, John, why don't you trust me to do the multiverse? I try so hard to please you, Mr. Campia. I gave Spider-Man friggin' Iron Man powers. He is not cool enough for you, Mr. Campia. Huh? Fine. I'll just give him magic. Blame yourself. Uh, deuces, nerds. Eat it. Um, look, again, I look, this is, this is where it gets difficult because when you do what I do for a living, there is always the temptation to say what the audience wants to hear you say. Say the popular thing. Say what everybody agrees with. 
And I know some of your favorite YouTubers do that because they've told me. I'm not going to name names. And there's always that temptation. Say the popular thing. Ride the popular wave. Say what everybody always agrees with. But if I did that, I'd be betraying you as people who do me the honor of watching my videos. I'd be betraying you by not giving you my honest thoughts. And giving you my honest thoughts means that sometimes I have to say the unpopular thing. The thing that isn't the cool thing to say. The thing that isn't riding the, the fandom wave. And you guys know me. I'm a big fan of the MCU. I am. I'm a, I'm a big, big fan of the MCU. I know a lot of people didn't like Loki. I liked Loki. It wasn't, I didn't think it was as good as WandaVision or Falcon the Winter Soldier, but I like Loki. But I think you have to be foolish not to recognize the potential pitfalls that could lie ahead if Marvel goes too batshit crazy into multiverse and timelines and multiple earths and all this kind of stuff. Like this is real hardcore comic book geek stuff that I don't know that the average movie going audience is going to embrace as much as they had the more ground it feels weird to say that about marvel they're more grounded stuff like the magic asgardian god with his magical hammer flying on a rainbow bridge through different dimensions yeah that was grounded compared to what it looks like we're heading into now i'm not saying you got to be foolish not to recognize this is going to lead them to disaster. No, 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 no. But what I am saying is I think it is foolish to not at least acknowledge because I've already had some people tell me who are not into the hardcoreness of it all have already told me just by watching Loki. They were like, eh, I, don't, I didn't get it. I didn't get it. I'm out. I mean, it just got too kind of too weird. I'm not saying the majority of people told me that. Not at all. But I, I had people who really like the MCU start telling me they kind of checked out. And as they go forward, and if they start getting more nutty and more batshit crazy and all this kind of stuff, you'd have to be foolish not to recognize there is the potential that they run a risk of alienating a lot of the non-hardcore comic book fans. And it's the non-hardcore comic book fans that makes the MCU the biggest and most powerful thing in entertainment today. Not us 5%ers. It's those 95%ers that do that. Now, again, I'm not sitting here casting doom and gloom saying, MCU is now done. They're dying. No, 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 no. I, 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 Kevin Feige has earned the benefit of the doubt. He's got a great team of people. I think if anybody can do this and make it work, I think he's the one who can do it and make it work. But again, I think you're being that ostrich that sticks their heads in the sand to not at least look at it and go, they're going to have to be careful. They got to do this delicately. They, they got to be mindful of the fact that they do run the risk of alienating the bunch of the audience if it's not handled right. And I ain't saying they're not going to handle it right. I'm just saying they're going to have to be very, very careful with this. Because I've already heard from some people that just from Loki by itself feel like they want to jump ship. And I think they're going to go more crazy after this. I'm just saying, I'm not saying it means it's not going to work. I'm just saying they got to recognize there's some danger here if they're not careful. That's all I'm saying. That's all I've said from day one. That's all I'm saying now. So let's see how they navigate it. Okay, and again, I know that's not the popular thing to say. I know the popular thing to say is, it's Marvel, so anything they do is going to be the best thing ever. I know that's the popular thing to say. And sometimes I come damn close to sounding like that. I recognize that. But again, you got to be objective and you got to be realistic. And I think they're entering into a very exciting but potentially dangerous uh, phase of things if they don't if they're not careful with how they approach it. That's all I'm saying. All right, let's move on here. Uh, next up, a spider fetus is better than Spider-Man writes. Not that I like it, but I just think Marvel wants to make their Spider-Man deeply integrated into the MCU. I have to assume they were afraid of copying the other two series. I honestly don't think it's because they think he's not cool enough. Also, toys, John. Yes, of course, because you know what? I, I am a big fan of... Spider-Man Homecoming and Spider-Man Far From Home. 
I am truly a big fan of Tom Holland as Spider-Man. I very much, and what John Watts has done directing these movies has been great. It's a tall order he faced, you know, bringing Spider-Man into the MCU. I think they've been great. But just because I think they're great doesn't mean I can't have criticisms. And of course, my big criticism of Spider-Man in the MCU so far is they've not really let him just be Spider-Man. They had to make him Iron Man Jr. So, uh, Spider-Man? Yeah. He's a good kid, but you know he's not cool. You know what the kid he's like? Iron Man. They like him. Yeah, yeah. Everybody knows you're not a real superhero unless you got a built-in armor suit with a built-in AI system like Jarvis that can talk to you and unleash weapons and give you directions to the local McDonald's and have a bunch of missiles fly out or have the mechanical spider arms come out and blah, blah. Like, unless he has that, he's not really cool. And so uh, they've, they've kind of made him not Spider-Man in many ways. And then... I've still loved it. I've still loved it. Again, just criticism that why can't you just let Spider-Man be Spider-Man and why do you have to make him Iron Man Jr.? And now with the hot toy picture coming out, showing him wielding mystical energies, it's like, oh, so Tony Stark's dead. Now we got to make him Doctor Strange Jr. And by the way, I'm going to give them the benefit of the doubt until we actually see it. I'm not going to jump to wild conclusions until we see it. But again, you know, just see the picture. Like, I'm a little bit worried. It's like, what, are they just going to make him Doctor Strange Jr. now? Again, I'll take all those expectations and all those worries and all those fears and I'll leave them at the door when it's time to watch the movie and I'll give them the benefit of the doubt. But yeah, I'm very excited to see No Way Home. I am. I'm super excited about it. But again, I'm going to admit, I just kind of rolled my eyes when I saw Spider-Man wielding mystical energies because once again, Spider's not cool enough. But again, yes, toys. But here's the thing. I, I hope Marvel... Put your story first. I really hope they're not making these decisions based on toy sales. I, I, I mean, all four of them making big money on toys, but don't make your movie decisions based on toy sales. I, I don't know. I'm a little bit worried about that, but eh, whatever. We'll see. All right. Next up, we got Jesse who writes um, one or two. I don't know why, but something felt oddly satisfying to me seeing Kang betray Sylvie and, oh, berate Sylvie, sorry, seeing Kang berate Sylvie and call her a hypocrite for the lives she's taken. Again, I don't know why I, I don't know why as I enjoy the Sylvie character, maybe it's just because I wasn't expecting him to do it. Well, well let's go to part two of two first. Aside from that, I really like Major's portrayal of Kang. I loved Major's portrayal as Kang, but I wonder if the other versions like the one in Ant-Man, will have the same personality traits that this Kang did. Seems like a fun role for Majors if each Kang has a different personality type. So, first of all, talking about the Sylvie thing, I loved it because he was just speaking the truth. He was just speaking the truth. And I think if he didn't say that, it would have felt that made the scene feel odd. So I love that he did that. Now, on top of that, what I think you're going to see is I think you're going to see the core personality of the Kang variants relatively similar, but maybe the ethics will be a little bit differently. Maybe a little bit of the worldview will be a little bit different. Maybe a little bit of what their ultimate end goals are, or going to be a little bit. Different. So I think we'll see a core personality, but then there's a lot of different ways that that core personality can be expressed through those different avenues. And so I'm thinking we're going to see every Kang variant and who knows, maybe we'll see 50 new Kang variants, maybe we'll only see one. But, however many there are, I think we're going to see slightly unique, not night and day differences, but I think we're going to see slightly unique, but slight changes can have profound outcomes, right? So, after, I loved what Majors did with this one variation of Kang. It's going to be neat to see what he does with the other variations of Kang as well. Thanks for writing that in, Jesse. All right, next up, we got Sir Ivan K. Bennett writes, Heads up, John. I know that you dislike the idea of Spider-Man as Iron Man and Doctor Strange Jr., but blame Sony slash Avi Arad for that. He said they wanted to capitalize on using the other Marvel characters while they could. Otherwise, it'd just be Spidey. Um, no, you can't really blame Sony or Avi Arad because, listen, Sony has final word on what they will or will not let Spider-Man do in this thing, but it's still Marvel's production. And it's Marvel that has the toy rights. And it's all that kind of stuff. It's not a Sony thing. This is this is a Marvel thing. Now, Sony easily could have said no 
to it, Sony could have said, no, you can't make Spider-Man into Doctor Strange Jr. They could have said no to that, and Marvel would have had to come up with a new thing to do. But, you know, they went along with it. So I'll blame them as much. But, but uh, yeah, this is an obvious rod uh, sort of thing. But I will say, since Sony has to give their stamp of approval on things, probably hold them just as responsible. <laughs> Can probably hold them just as responsible. But who knows? Maybe it'll be the greatest thing ever. We'll have to wait and see. All right. Uh, 1.21 Jellowatts writes, my communications teachers always said repetition is the key to retention. Repetition is the key to retention. Repetition is the key to retention. Uh, that always stuck with me. Keep up the great work and bring on the filthy. Well, for those of you who don't know why uh, 1.2 Jillowatts brought up brought that up is because the other day I kind of explained on the show because of something that came up where somebody clearly didn't listen to what I was saying. But, you know, I will sometimes get criticized and I recognize this and I'm aware of this, but I do it on purpose. I will sometimes get criticized that I will often repeat certain points a number of times. That's not by accident. I have always done that and I always will because it is a key communications uh, tool. Repetition, as you said, is the key to retention. And we have seen, and I have seen so often, when I don't report, uh, I should say, when I don't repeat certain key points, I will often get inundated with people who completely misrepresent what I said, even though I said it very clearly. But because I didn't say it three or four times, it they didn't retain it and they made assumptions and, and things like that. So, yes. I know there are some people, I get it, who find it a little bit annoying sometimes that I will repeat certain points. But it is a key important part of communicating. And especially if you want people to comprehend and understand exactly what it is you're trying to say, because there's a lot of room for misinterpretation and a lot of room for people just tuning out and only hearing what they want to hear. And that's why it's important to get those key points and repeat it and repeat it and repeat it. And I think that is part of the reason why I've had success. And I know the consequences of when I don't do it. I've I've seen it a lot. But anyway, thanks for that, 1.21. I appreciate that very much. Thanks for sending that in, man. All right. NGF Mike writes, Hey, John and crew, one of three. I know you've said many times, John Williams is your favorite film composer. Absolutely. For me, that guy is Hans Zimmer. Hans is fantastic. He's absolutely great. Uh, personally, whenever I'm in a rut and I need to get uh, the creative juices flowing, I put on... Uh, what are you going to do when you're not saving the world? I put that on. I get my my Google speaker, and I always say, I got to whisper it or else it'll turn on. I always say, hey, Google. And then it goes, boop. And I say, play. What are you going to do when you're not saving the world by Hans Zimmer? At least once or twice a week, I do that. When I'm in the shower, I have that piece of music playing. It just gets my blood flowing. It's from Man of Steel, for those of you who don't know. Uh, it gets my blood flowing, and it just gets me ready for the day. I love that piece. Anyway, those first few piano notes, dun, dun. And uh, and instantly I'm inspired. Other Zimmer pieces that do the same are Stay from Interstellar and, of course, Time. And I'll throw in a Williams piece with Binary Sunset. Which piece of film score do you throw on when you need that little kick of inspiration, whether it's from John Williams, Hans Zimmer, or any other composer you can think of off the top of your head? Thanks for all you do and bye bye Yes, look. Who your favorite composer is, is, is always going to be as subjective as the movies themselves. You know, and it's always going to be, does that music speak to you? Because that music may speak to you and it may not speak to somebody else. But does it speak to you? Hans Zimmer is fantastic. Again, like I said, at least once or twice a week, I put on What Are You Going to Do When You're Not Saving the World from Man of Steel, which is kind of the same music as from First Flight. Um, I love that music so much. It's just, it gets me going. I, I, staying on the Superman theme, so does John Williams' original piece. John Williams' original Superman thing. Bum, 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 bum. I mean, when that horn hits, like you just feel excited. Bum, 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 but it's still John Williams to me. Almost every major, significant, memorable movie score theme that people can hum along to came from John Williams. He just had that ability that almost no one else ever had to that level. Whether it's Harry Potter, 
Dun, 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 dun. Like everybody knows that. Jurassic World. Ba 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 ba. Indiana Jones. Bum ba bum ba bum ba ba. Superman, of course. Star Wars, of course. The Imperial March and thing. But it just goes on and 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 on. You can name that song, name those tunes, immediately be transported there. Now it's funny because uh, like one of my favorites is actually the the work Howard Shore did on Lord of the Rings. God, I you put on almost any track from Lord of the Rings, specifically stuff that re revolved around the Shire. And my, I almost freeze and my entire consciousness is taken to Middle Earth and to the Shire. Like I, I it, that music starts to play almost anything from Lord of the Rings starts to play. And my whole being is taken there. And that's huge. But yes, Hans Zimmer is awesome. And I particularly like the Man of Steel soundtrack. All right. Thanks a lot for that, man. Next up, Simon writes, John, did you get a chance to see Fatherhood Netflix film starring Kevin Hart? And what did you think about it? I skipped it. I skipped it. I didn't watch it. Number one, I find most Netflix films are crap. Um, and I saw the trailer. I, look, I am still intrigued by it, though, because from everything that it looks like and from what I hear, it's Kevin Hart. Still doing his Kevin Hart shtick, which I, by the way, I'm a big fan of the Kevin Hart shtick. I've not gotten tired of Kevin Hart's comedic stick shtick yet at all. I still love it, but it's him also trying to stretch a bit and get a little bit more dramatic. And I find that very interesting. I haven't heard wonderful things about it, but I am still interested in it, but I have skipped it up till now. At some point I'll get around to watching it though. All right. Thanks for that, Simon. Next up, we've got uh, anonymous viewer writes, he writes, well, I guess Feige will uh, debut a main movie character in the TV shows. That being said, I get that wasn't the Kang we're going to see in the movie. Well, I mean, it's Kang. Pfft, it's Kang. Uh, and did I miss the Loki in the gold throne room from the trailer actually in the show? Here's the funny thing. Um, I had somebody mention to me, and I wasn't aware of this, that that was actually from a deleted scene from Thor 2. I mean, maybe that information is right. Maybe that information is wrong. But look, what you saw was as much Kang as any other Kang variant we're going to see. And I, I believe, I don't know this, so this is just blind fan speculation. I believe we're going to see multiple other Kangs. And they're all Kang. They're all Kang. They'll each have their own little uniquenesses about them, but they're all essentially Kang. So the Kang we saw in Loki is every bit as much Kang as whatever another Kang we're going to see. And maybe that's just going to be one Kang. Maybe it's going to be five more Kangs. Maybe it's going to be 50 more Kangs. Maybe we'll get an entire army of Kangs. I mean, I don't know, but uh, they're all Kang. So that's kind of the way I look at it at any rate. All right, next up. Justice for Jet Skis writes, John. I agree with you regarding MCU's direction. If anyone can pull it off, it's Kevin Feige. I agree. However, they just had half of existence snapped away. They brought back via time heist. Now we transition to infinite realities collapsing into each other. It's a lot. Um, no, listen, it is a lot. That's why I was joking a little bit earlier when I was saying, you know, the MCU's been more grounded. Like the magical Asgardian guard with his magical hammer flying over rainbow bridges, traveling between worlds. And I called that grounded. But... It is grounded compared to the wonkiness that we're getting into. A kind of wonkiness that even the comic books themselves realized made things go out of control. And comic books had to come up with these big events in their comics to bring everything back into singular realities. Because it was just getting too convoluted and too messy, even for the comic books. And they had to do that. So, you know, going where angels fear to tread... It's, it's a little dangerous. It could have big payoffs. No guts, no glory. No risk, no reward. So this could be awesome. And maybe I, I haven't emphasized that part enough. You know, it's like this is a big game. I've been emphasizing the part where it's a gamble and it's risky and there are dangers. There are. But no risk, no reward. It could also pay off in huge, huge, big fan reactions, right? It could be great. Could be the best thing they've ever done. They've got to be careful because there are dangers and I'm already seeing. And if you're honest with yourself, you're probably got some people in your circles too. They're just kind of like, eh, you, you know what I mean? And like, even when the comic books themselves realized this is too convoluted and they had to come up with these big events to bring it back. I think it's something they have to approach with caution. 
And you know what? There's an argument to be made. The greatest things will take the greatest risks. And uh, this is a risk. It is a bit of a risk. But we'll see how it goes. Justice for Jet Skis. I love that name, by the way. All right. Miguel Zan writes, Hey, John. Apologies that this has been brought up in uh, the show, but why was Don Cheadle nominated for Falcon the Winter Soldier? Uh, If they were going to nominate someone from that show, wouldn't it have been Carl uh, Lumby slash Isaiah Bradley? Like, what the fuck? Thanks and God bless. Well, that, yeah, I've seen that going around a lot, but let's be very, very clear about this. Carl Lumby did not qualify. He could not have been nominated because Carl Lumby is, by definition, a supporting character in the show, not a guest appearance. Carl Lumby, I I believe he appeared in like three episodes. He wasn't a guest appearance. Don Cheadle was nominated specifically in the category of guest appearance, not best supporting actor, not best lead actor. They don't have guest appearance in the movies, but in the Emmys they do. There's a best guest appearance thing for somebody who just pops up for an episode, right? And then goes away. Now I downloaded the Emmys rules and regulation books and I couldn't find specific, like it was very vague. It's like when it came to guest appearances, it felt like they intentionally left it a little bit nebulous, like up to the individual interpretation. But generally speaking, generally speaking, it's a character who pops up for like one episode and then is gone. So even if Don Cheadle didn't get this nomination, it's like like some people are talking on lines like Don Cheadle getting that nomination took the nomination away from Carl Lumby. It's like, no, 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 no. Even if Don Cheadle hadn't been nominated, Carl wouldn't have gotten nominated for it because he doesn't qualify for that category. He's in a different category. He would have been nominated for Best Supporting Actor if he was going to get a nomination at all. So Don Cheadle getting that nomination had nothing to do with Carl, and it had certainly nothing to do with Carl not getting a nomination himself. Now, that still raises the question. He was literally on screen for two to three minutes. He was literally on screen for two to three minutes, Don Cheadle. And he was very good, but... Was that two to three minutes enough for a best guest appearance Emmy nomination? I guess it was. I guess it was. I mean, it's up to the uh, to the Emmys to decide that, I suppose. But again, just be clear. It had nothing to do with Car- Carl. There's no point in trying to bring in those two names into the same conversation because they would have been for completely different categories. If Carl was going to be nominated, it would have been for best supporting. If Don Cheadle is going to be nominated, it's going to be for best guest appearance not vice versa. So keep, just keep that in mind. All right. Thanks for asking, Miguel. Next up, uh, uh, Joe Tigers. Go Tigers. I see what they're saying. Uh, thought the finale was wonderfully tragic. I'm assuming we're talking about Loki. Uh, we knew Kang was going to die and that it would mean that our Loki would lose on multiple levels. I didn't know Kang was going to die. Um, yet Loki and the audience had to follow the journey and watch as he slowly realized it was inevitable. Well, I mean, I don't agree. Um, at least from my own personal point of view, I didn't necessarily think Kang was going to die. At least that that version of Kang. I don't think I think there's a lot of people that didn't, you know, just assume that that version of Kang was going to die. But again, you are right. We had to follow along the journey with Loki. And what a tragic way for it to end, especially with him coming to that place with, with his character that he did of I don't need a throne. I just want to protect reality and I want to protect you only then to be betrayed and not only be betrayed and know all of reality is now at risk and then find the one other friend he has in all of reality. And now that friend doesn't even recognize him because reality itself has been altered underneath his feet. I mean, that was a bad day for poor Loki at the end of that thing, like a really bad day for poor Loki. All right. Thanks for sending that in, man. Uh, Chuck, the mystery writes, Hey, John and Rob, Rob's not here right now. Obviously I was wondering what is an example of a film that you've watched where you thought to yourself, if ever there were a movie I want to see a sequel to, it is uh, this is it. Yet the film never got a sequel and only one film was ever made. Thanks. Um, well, I talk about this one quite a bit, actually. And it's going to sound silly, but it's true. There is a movie I've always wanted to reboot to. Now that, I know that's different from what you're asking, but let me start it off by saying there's a movie I've always wanted to reboot to. 
And the movie I've always wanted to reboot to was Megaforce, um, which came out the same year um, as uh, Blade Runner. And I think uh, I also think came out the same year as Star Trek to the Wrath of Khan. At least I think it did. Um, so, yeah, there's that. The movie I always wanted a sequel to, though, was Mystery Men. Mystery Men is a movie that was so far ahead of its time, it's crazy. But I loved this movie from day one. From the first time I saw this film, long before comic book movies were popular. This movie is a movie I fell in love with and I've been in love with almost my whole life. I, I love this movie. And I have always wanted a sequel. Especially today. I think a sequel today. I mean, look at this cast. Hank Azaria, Ben Stiller, uh, Gene Garofalo, Pee Wee Herman. I mean, this William H. Macy as the shoveler. Mr. Furious, the Blue Raja, the Bowler, the Spleen, the Invisible Boy, Casanova Frankenstein, Captain Amazing, whatever you want to bring in. The, this movie was so far ahead of its time, I have always wanted, not a reboot, I have wanted a sequel. 30 years later, where are they now? What are these guys, what are these heroes doing now? I've always wanted it. I know that may sound like an oddball kind of a choice, but man, if there was a movie that I could just instantly pick and say, this one needs to get a sequel that never got, it would be Mystery Men. And it, it will always be that way for me, my friend. It will always be that way for me. All right, next up. Dangerous Lee writes, Loki finale gave me some serious Apocalypse Now vibes. A little bit, yeah. The episode itself was fine, but that ending felt a bit deflating. And now I feel lost, left out because I'm totally confused. Well, listen, Dangerous Lee, you're not alone. And I get it. I get it. There was a lot in that exposition dump at the end. Now, listen, some people act like exposition uh, ex, uh, exposition dumps are always, always, by default, bad things. They're not. Sometimes a well-timed exposition dump is perfectly needed, and it helps a story move, and it can be great. This was the reason that I really thought episode five should have introduced us to Kang. Not so we could have Kang in episode five, but because if we're already introduced to him, that gives all of episode six a lot more room to breathe. So all this ex exposition dump can be done with a little bit better of a pace. They could have, in, you know, they could have uh, implemented a little bit of show, don't tell. When you have less time, you just got to tell. You just got to tell. But if you gave yourself a little bit more breathing room, you can do a little bit more show, don't tell, which is always more effective. But... Yeah, the fact that you felt lost and confused, I'm not surprised. There, there are a number of people who felt that way. And it may only get worse, depending on how convoluted they go. But, look, the basics of it is this. The multiverse is now going crazy, so there's going to be a lot of versions of Kang that are now going to be unleashed. And some of them, I mean, you can say that even this Kang was the villain of this story. Well, Kang is basically saying in this thing, if you think I'm bad, there are some versions of me that are way worse that you're going to have to be really worried about because they're not going to have the restraint that I had. And now there's going to be a lot of these Kangs out there, but they're aware of the multiness of the multiverse and they're going to be committed to the destruction of all the other multiverses and it could lead to the end of all the multiverses and all reality. That's the basics of it. Now, why reality itself was shifted at the TVA that Loki showed up and Mobius didn't even recognize him? I'm not sure. Because it's not like that's a new timeline because time doesn't affect the TVA. So because it's outside of time. So I'm not I'm not sure either. But that's okay. We don't have to have all the answers at the end of one season. They can leave some of the answers to come later. But don't feel bad dangerously that you felt a little confused because I think a lot of people did. All right. Next up. We got Chuck the Mystery who writes. Thrilled to hear of the positive early reactions to Suicide Squad. With 2021 changing expectations for what a box office success is, how much does Suicide Squad need to make in theaters for a sequel to be greenlit, bearing in mind that it'll also be on HBO? I, I'm not really sure, Chuck, the mystery. Because, I mean, HBO has so crapped the bed. Warner Brothers crapped the bed so much with their whole HBO thing 
that they've really hamstrung a lot of these movies, which is why filmmakers like Denis Villeneuve of Dune, like James Gunn had some things to say about this, like Christopher Nolan had a lot of very angry things to say about this. The whole HBO thing has hamstrung a lot of these filmmakers and they know that has put their projects at risk of doing less well financially than they could have done, which hurts their chances of getting sequels or follow-ups and things like that, right? I honestly don't know what Suicide Squad's going to do. I really don't. Because while people like you and me are deliriously excited about what we're hearing come out of that it's gorely, beautifully violent and visceral and nutty and all this kind of stuff. Is that going to appeal to a lot of the average movie going audience? Now, the first Suicide Squad movie made, I believe, $800 million in the 800s. If I'm not mistaken, I believe that first Suicide movie made into the 800 million. So a lot of people wanted to go see it. But unfortunately, a lot of people didn't like it. Are they going to come back to another one are they going to come back to another one if they can just sit at home and watch it for free on HBO, which is going to hurt the box office for for uh, this Suicide Squad? And will the completely visceral violence of it turn some potential audiences off? Probably. Here's what I'm thinking. If this movie can make $400 million, if this movie can make $400 million, I think they consider that a big win. And I think... Because you got to keep in mind, you know, it's fighting an uphill battle against the reputation of the last movie. I personally had fun with the first Suicide Squad. I know a lot of you didn't. I personally had fun with the first Suicide Squad. I didn't think it was great, but I had fun with it, and I don't apologize for that. Um, But it's had an uphill battle to fight the whole time against the reputation of the previous one. It's got another uphill battle to fight because it's got the HBO thing it's got to fight with with the box office. It's got another uphill battle to fight because, you know, a lot of people are stupid and now we're getting spikes in the in the pandemic again. The numbers are going up. Los Angeles County is going to have to read. They've they've had like tripled or quadrupled and in some uh, counties like 10 times the amount of new coronavirus cases have gone up over the past couple of weeks when the numbers were going down, 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 down. They've like spiked by 10 X in some places. So L.A. County starting next week or later this week is re-implementing their face mask rules indoors. If you're indoors, you gotta be wearing face mask. And we had been, we'd gotten through that, but you know, a lot of people are dumb. They still don't want to take it seriously. But now that we're getting spikes again in the pandemic, while maybe it's not going to shut the movie theaters down, that's another thing that it's going to have to fight against. So, I think and I hope that the executives at Warner Brothers recognize that they cannot expect the regular, you know, they can't expect the box office returns from this Suicide Squad as maybe they normally would for a big tentpole movie that's getting a big release. Because it's fighting against the reputation of the previous one. It's fighting against a free home to watch option. It's fighting against a resurging pandemic. So I'm going to say if they make 400 million, They should take that as a big win and say, yeah, we should do another one. At least I hope they do. So we'll see where they go with that. All right. Next up, we got not Sam Wilson writes. Uh, Hey, John. Regarding Marvel doesn't think Spider-Man is cool enough. I actually like the idea that Marvel is doing a different take on Spidey. They seem to be asking what responsibility do the heroes have to mentor, mentor and look after a super powered minor. Uh, there was a lot made by Tony and others about how they are responsible for Peter's life. At the end of the day, the character is still a high school student. And I think they want to keep uh, that practical approach of a kind of superhero apprenticeship. I could be wrong, but I think when the character becomes an adult and graduates from high school, he will get more autonomy. Well, probably because he's not going to be in the MCU anymore by that point. But anyway, uh, we have seen two versions where Peter gets powers, trains in a montage, and is a full hero. For me, this has been a cool change. I Look, I, I understand that argument, but there's a difference between Tony Stark checking in with Peter Parker once in a while to give him advice, give him guidance, that kind of stuff, and saying, here, kid, be a small version of me. Here's an Iron Man suit of armor that's got a paint job so it looks like your Spider-Man costume. But it's an Iron Man armor. Uh, but it's just painted to look like Spider-Man. And then going into Doctor Strange, okay, cool, kid. Like, in, There's a difference between mentoring 
and then making the character into a mini version of that character, right? And by the way, we don't know that that's what they're going to do in Spider-Man No Way Home, right? We don't know that. We're just, I'm just making some blind assumptions based on some toy releases. They may not do that at all. They may not do that in the least. So know that I am cognizant of that. I am. I'm totally aware of that. Totally am. But it is a little bit worrisome, right? It's a little bit worrisome. I mean, you know, we've seen in lots of iterations of literature, lore, and comics, Thor a certain way, but they didn't bring Thor into the MCU and say, you know what Thor really needs? Thor needs a Captain America shield. Let's give Thor a big Captain America shield with a big star on it. Because Captain America's cooler, you know? They, they, they didn't do that. You can have that mentoring kind of thing going on, which is an aspect of the Tony... Peter relationship in the first two Spider-Man movies that I really did like. Like, I love that whole mentorship idea. I really do. I thought that was very good. And one of the reasons why I like those movies so much. Because I was... When when Spider-Man Homecoming was first coming out, I confess that I was really worried that it was going to be Iron Man 4 with special guest star Spider-Man. I was very worried about that. Because Iron Man was in so much of the trailers... Um, you've got a star like Robert Downey Jr. Who's a larger than life star. Well, when it comes to the MCU at any rate. And I was really worried it was going to be Iron Man four with special guest star Spider-Man, but it wasn't, it was a Spider-Man movie. And that, that aspect of that almost, whether you want to call it big brother or parental relationship that Tony had with them, that actually worked really well. But there's a difference between that in saying, okay, now let's give Spider-Man his own suit of Iron Man armor. Because you, you can say whatever you want, but that's exactly what it was. It was Iron Man armor that had a Spider-Man paint job on it. Had the built-in AI system, a weapon system. like all. That's not Spider-Man. That's not Spider-Man. I still love the movie. I still love the movie. But So I agree with you, not Sam Wilson, on the mentorship part. I, I appreciate that. I do. I just think... That mentoring doesn't mean you have to make this world's, one of the world's most popular comic book characters into a mini junior version of whatever the mentor, the mentor character is. That's all I'm saying. And again, they may not be doing that in Spider-Man No Way Home at all. They may not be doing that in the least. Like, these, these are just like worries and some assumptions I'm making based on some stupid toy pictures, right? They may not do that at all, but it's just the one thing I'm a little bit worried about. All right. Let's go to this one. Uh, an anonymous viewer writes in, Hey, John and Rob. Rob's not here right now, obviously. One of three. Loki was great and has a few uh, items stand out to me. And has a few items stand out to me. Number one, Loki uh, singing what he has. Loki signing. I almost said singing. Signing what he has said in the past was foreshadowing the script at the end of at the end. Was it? Anyway, two. Because of what happened with Kang showing him exactly what he said. I don't know if that was a foreshadow. I don't know if that was a foreshadow. It was a nice callback. I don't think it was a foreshadow, but it was a very cool kind of fun callback. Anyway, uh, two or three. I'm assuming this is James. Uh, Nathaniel had Ms. Minutes tell Ravona to download a file, which I presume is the script and instructions for Eliath. I don't think so. I don't think so. Uh, four, the script ends at the time it is downloaded, and that is why Nathaniel doesn't know what happens past a certain point. I, I don't think that's what was happening either. That's my take on it. Anyway, and three of three, uh, five, Ravona left her office with a case, script and instructions for Eliath to deliver to Nathaniel at a point in time. By the way, Nathaniel is, is another thing of Kang connected to the Richards family. Long story. Anyway, uh, at a point in time, feel like they are stuck in a casual loop, just like Star Trek, the next generation episode cause and effect. I, I mean, I like the way you're, you're thinking very sci-fi there. I like that. Well done. Um, I don't know that I agree. I think there were breadcrumbs laid out. I, I don't think there were specific instructions being given to Ravona. I think there were breadcrumbs there for her to still unlock a mystery. 
I, I got the feeling at the end of that, like clearly she was still locked in a frame of mind that she needed to solve this mystery. She still believed in the mission of the TVA, but there's a mystery here. Who is behind this? The timekeepers were a lie. What's going on? Ms. Minutes passes on certain things to her that she gets to read. She reads them. And what's what I think is really key here is what's the last thing she says before going through that portal? I'm going to go look for free will. You know, and I think that says a lot there. So I don't think it was pure instructions like I am Kang. You work for me. Here's what I need you to do next. I It doesn't it didn't feel like that's what they were doing. But again, you're the way you've theorized that and put that all together. That's very sci fi thinking. And I like that. And maybe there's some maybe there's some some, some uh, substance to that. Maybe let's uh, let's wait and uh, wait and find out. But again, just because of the way it unraveled and and what seemed to be Ravona's mindset when she was leaving and the word she used when she left, it doesn't sound like it was that, but it might be. So let's see. OK, next up, uh, we do film love and bro who writes, hey, John. Uh, are we all hog wild for pig yet at 90% rotten tomatoes and 86% on Metacritic. This looks far from being just another unhinged Nick cage flick and the runt of the litter. And instead may, may turn out to be one of the best of the year. Who knew? Yeah. Listen, I am very, I haven't seen pig yet. I am very interested in it. Like the trailer is really fascinating. I mean, it looks like just a really deep character movie. And at first it looked like it was going to be like another Nick Cage throwaway thing. Like if you haven't seen the trailer for like, he's this kind of crazy guy living in the wilderness and he's got this pig and the pig is clearly a truffle hunting pig. Like he takes this pig out into the woods because, and I've seen documentary stuff. I've seen like videos on this where only these like certain pigs can find really good truffles. Right. And they only, they can find them. And he's got this pig and he cares for this pig. And then something happens and somebody takes his pig and he goes into the city looking for his pig. And at first it looks like, oh, this is going to be one of these John Wick revenge flicks where it's like, oh, no, like instead of a dog, they, they took away his pig. And he's going to go crazy, right? But no, it just looks like a really deep character movie about this guy who apparently used to have it all and gave it a gave it all up and wanted to just get away from everything. And it's, really interesting. The one thing that he cares about is this pig. And you know what? By the end of the trailer, I was completely on board with it. So yeah, film love and bro. I personally cannot wait to see this thing. I really can't. All right. Thanks for writing that in, man. Next up off topic rights. I get your concern of MCU getting too crazy, but the true red flag will be if Jim, <laughs> if Jim Carrey gets cast as a costume accurate electro and Tommy Lee Jones as Dr. Doom, if that happens run for the Hills so far, we are only a level yellow on the Schumacher threat level. Now, of course that's a reference to the Batman and Robin thing. And by the way, I didn't think Jim Carrey was all that bad of a, of a Riddler. I didn't think he was all that bad of a Riddler. I actually think he was okay. Did I say Batman? I think that was Batman Forever. Anyway, I thought he was actually okay as the Riddler. I thought there was some potential there. The problem, well, there were many problems with the movie, let's be honest. But as far as the villain side goes, the problem to me was Tommy Lee Jones, who is one of the great actors of our generation. But it's almost like he didn't know what to do with that Two-Face. And instead of like really developing a Two-Face... He tried to be Jim Carrey. Like he tried to match the almost like the personality and energy level of Jim Carrey's Riddler, which was the wrong approach. It was the wrong approach. Now, again, that's not the only thing. There's many things wrong with that. But yes, we are far away from that level off topic. We are far away from that level. All right, next up, an anonymous viewer writes, uh, hey, John. Love the Loki finale and our first taste of Kang. Major's performance was great, and especially that creepy, unsettling score behind the dialogue. Got me feeling if the good version is that menacing, the Conqueror is going to be unpredictable and scary. Well, don't forget, like, even this iteration of Kang, he was, he did, a, like, even this version of Kang said, he did a lot of bad things. And even he was called Conqueror. Remember, this is also a Kang the Conqueror. He himself has been called the Conqueror. So this is that. I don't think this is the kind, benevolent, you know, Kang of the universe. He clearly had a dark side. 
So I don't think he was the goodest. The goodest? Did he just say the goodest? Yeah, I said the goodest. I don't think he was the goodest of the Kangs, but he wasn't the worst. That's what he's saying. If you think I'm bad, there's others who don't have the restraint that I have, who don't have certain, like, maybe you don't like that I have certain boundaries. You don't like that my boundaries are so wide, but there are other variants of me that boundaries are even further. Right. So it is going to be really, really interesting to see where they go with that. Thanks for writing that in anonymous. Next up, James L. H. writes, Hey, John, I have to say when you were answering a question about Marvel, not handling the multiverse or something, I almost expected to hear your shout and your best Nicholson. You can't handle the truth. I have no idea why, why handle made me think that, but it did. Yeah, I guess when, that's when I was first talking to somebody who said, like, there's no, everything's going to be perfect with this. And I'm saying, look, I think you got to be foolish to not acknowledge there's some danger here going in the direction they're going. But yeah, I, it almost did feel like I was about to burst out that Nicholson from a few good men. You can't handle the truth. Tom Cruise saying, I want the truth. That's a great scene, by the way. That's a great iconic scene. All right, next up. Uh, Alexis Rosales writes, Loki, Mobius, and B-15 were all at the TVA the moment that Kang was killed. So why is it that Loki is the only one that still remembers the old reality? Why wasn't his memory affected by the reality change if he was also there at the TVA? My only theory, and there's no definitive answer for this, Alexis. There's no definitive answer. My only theory is that, remember when they were all in Kang's chamber? And Kang's like, we just crossed the threshold. I think that was the moment that reality at the TVA changed. Because remember, that they just passed a moment that even Kang himself could not see beyond. And, and again, this is just a theory, and it's probably wrong, but the only theory I've got right now is that the changing of things didn't happen once Kang got murdered by Sylvie. It was the moment they crossed the threshold. The moment they crossed the threshold, now re reality itself was now different. And I think that's the moment. So I think by the time Loki got shoved through that portal by Sylvie, the TVA, the reality of the TVA had already been changed. Again, I don't know if that's right or not. That is just the best theory that I had. That the change didn't happen when he was stabbed. The change happened when he was like, We've crossed the threshold. I think that's when the change happened. I could be a thousand percent wrong on that. I'm not willing to put any money on it. That's just the best theory I've got right now. Okay, next up. James L.H. writes, Hey, John, one of two. In June, your companion video titled, Wait, is Loki and Doctor Strange 2? Uh, was, was from my question that Hiddleston said he was on set as Loki during his 40th birthday uh, in February, and I suggested he might be filming Doctor Strange. Only rumors... But there's still a chance uh, that was the case. If so, I'll take it as I am awful at speculations. I do agree with you that I believe and hope the multiverse story continues or concludes with Doctor Strange. I loved Endgame, but they only just got away with time travel. Now uh, they were wise not to drag that out. Oh, I agree. And I still think they're going to wrap this up with Doctor Strange too. But again, I don't know that. That's just me speculating. Could be 100% wrong. Don't know. So for those of you who don't know what James is talking about, about a month ago, uh, he wrote in a question, because I remember this, that was basically along the lines of, hey, I just heard Tom Hiddleston say that he was on set during his 40th birthday. Well, there he's in London, and they're shooting Doctor Strange 2 in London, and this was back in February. Does that mean he's in Doctor Strange 2? And I said, well... It's possible, but there are a couple things to keep in mind. Number one, while Loki had finished shooting, they still had some reshoots and some pickup shooting to do. So when he said he was on set in February, it's very, not just plausible, but probably likely that he was on set of Loki. Also, and I never verified this, so I could be wrong, but I believe Tom Hiddleston resides in London. Like, I believe that's where he lives. So... Say, saying that, wait a minute, Tom Hiddleston's in London and they're shooting Doctor Strange in London right now. I mean, he well, he lives in London, so that's not really a big thing. Now, I still think that what he was referring to was not Doctor Strange 2. 
But ever since that we got that report from the Hollywood Reporter saying that they believe, uh, it, it says it appears that Tom Hiddleston is appearing in Doctor Strange 2, I mean, your theory was already possible. Now it's plausible. I mean, it's not just remotely possible. It's like, eh, maybe it was. Or maybe it had nothing to do with that one specific circumstance and he was really just doing pickup shooting for Loki. It had nothing to do with Doctor Strange. That's poss- That's still probable, but you never know. It, it could be that, James. It could be that. We'll have to wait and see. All right, next up. Uh, Dev D writes, uh, Ms. Minutes equals creepy with the finale of Loki and the time stream branching. Maybe this is how we get Fantastic Four and X-Men. It's not. I mean, at this point, I think the multiverse theory is probably the most logical way to get them in the MCU. A natural way. Bring on the filthy and RIP John Schnapp. Yeah, again, the big pr- I'm hearing a lot of people saying that. But then again, every new Marvel property that comes out, people go, this is how they're going to bring in X-Men. Then the next, and it doesn't, of course. And then the next Marvel property comes out. This is how they're going to bring in X-Men. And then it doesn't, of course. Anything is possible, but remember this. And you guys have heard me say this before. Kevin Feige, when Fox was bought by Disney, Kevin Feige said, when asked about when are you bring in an X-Men, he said, I've got the next five years planned out. The next five years are already kind of mapped out. So after that's done, that's when we'll get to it. That means when Disney bought Fox, he already had Loki mapped out. They already knew they're going to do this multiverse thing and blah, blah, and had nothing to do with the X-Men. Nothing to do with the X-Men. So now we are about three and a half years since that happened, which means we're only about a year and a half away. But again, I, every single time a new Marvel property comes out, people say, this is going to be X-Men. And I remind them of what Kevin Feige said. And so far, surprise, surprise, what Kevin Feige said has held up to be true. So I still think it's true here. I don't think this is how they're going to bring in the X-Men. I don't think so. Or Fantastic Four or whatever. Now, is it possible? Of course it is. Could Kevin Feige and his team change their mind or change their plans? Of course they could, but so far they haven't. So I don't expect them to do, to do that yet. I listen, and I say that still being completely, I have no really valid theory about how they're going to do it. But, uh, in the next year and a half to two years, that's when we're going to start really getting some solid indications. So that's my thoughts on that right now. Thanks for writing that in Deb D next up the captain writes, and we'll end off today with this. Uh, the captain writes one of three. Hey, John, hope you're having a fantastic day. Thank you so much, man. I appreciate that. First time tipper, long time watcher from the AMC days. Thank you, dude. Good to have you here, man. I thought it was about time I tipped as you were my favorite YouTuber. Well, thank you so much. Hey, it's just good enough that you're here watching the videos, man. But thank you so much for the financial support. We appreciate that. As you're my favorite YouTuber and I love the whole crew. I'm a huge MCU fan and my minor Marvel Comics fan. Uh, I 100% agree with you that what Loki and potentially Doctor Strange can do is alienate casual fans. My partner has no clue about comics or casting, and both Loki and WandaVision confused her, and she would not have enjoyed them if I wasn't there. I am also from Australia, that's cool, and moving to Canada in late January, uh, good for you, man, uh, to try my hand at an acting career. I have had training here in Australia, so it's not a spur of the moment thing. If there is one thing I need to see in Canada, what do you recommend? All right. Well, first of all, let's start with a thing. I, I've been hearing a lot of that, Captain. I've been hearing a lot of that from various people writing in saying that some people during WandaVision, but we didn't really pay much attention to it. Like when they start talking about the and Nexus being and all, it's like, what? Uh, obviously Falcon Winter Soldier was very easy for everybody to follow along with. And now Loki, I have been hearing from people saying either I'm kind of stepping off this, this is too confusing for me or too convoluted, or this is a little too geeky. This is a little too inside baseball for comic book geeks. And I'm not one of those. A lot of people would say I'm not one of those. So I'm kind of stepping off. You're saying like your, your partner watches MCU with you, but when you got to, you know, Loki and and to a degree WandaVision, there's like, uh, I'm not following this. And you had to be there to walk them through it. And you're not alone. 
And I think Marvel fans are going to have to wake up and understand there are a lot of people out there who are part of the 95% group that they are feeling that. Again, all the faith in the world that Kevin Feige is going to be able to handle it, but they you got to recognize that this is kind of dangerous ground. They got to be careful. They're going to have to handle it delicately. And if anybody can do it, Kevin Feige can. As far as things you need to see in Canada, well, listen, the, it is the most beautiful country in the world. I mean, that's beyond dispute. Canada is the most beautiful country in the world. Like, and it's different depending on which area. It's also like the second largest country in the world. But so depending on where you go, see, you got to see the West Coast, the beautiful, the beautiful stuff in Alberta and and uh, and British Columbia. But I mean, obviously, I'm going to say you got to see Toronto, man. You got to see Toronto. It's just gorgeous. As as a native of Hamilton, Ontario, Canada, I am contractually obligated to say that I hate Toronto. Uh, Toronto is only 45 minutes outside of Hamilton, but. Toronto's a great city. I mean, it's just, it's everything you can possibly imagine what a truly great city should be. And uh, you really do. You're going to have to go there and visit that. All right, guys, listen up. There are still some more questions to come from Mike Thompson and Marie Seafring and Ian A. Barth and others. And do not worry, guys. I'm going to do a companion video tomorrow on Saturday, and we're going to get all caught up on the rest. There's not too many awful many to go here, so we're going to get all caught up with a companion video tomorrow. Hope you guys will join us for that. Guys, Thank you so much for watching this video today and making this video part of your day. Special thank you to all you guys who sent in these comments and questions. Number one, because you gave us great fun things to talk about. But number two, you supported this channel as you did it. And all of us involved with the John Campus Show, thank you guys so much for that support. And again, just as a reminder, if you want to get a comment or question read on the show, if it's appropriate for the show, just go use that tip link that's down in the description of this video, streamelements.com slash movieblogtv slash tip, and send one in anytime 24-7, and you'll see it in an upcoming John Campion show or companion video, whichever one we're able to get around to it first on. And thank you guys, all of you who did send that in and supporting our show on that level. All right, guys. I hope you have a fantastic weekend planned ahead for yourselves. Whether you need relaxation or you need some fun, whatever it is you need, I hope you get it this weekend to rest, relax, recoup, and be ready for another glorious week of triumph and victory come Monday. Thanks a lot for being here, guys. My name's John Campia, and until next time, my friends, bye-bye.